OFA is celebrating 10 years and it kind of crept up on me to be honest because it's gone really fast and it's just been amazing that we got to this point I'm like oh my god 10 years years ago, 12 years ago, I moved here from the UK and moved to a sleepy town called Oakville. And sitting in the town square one night, up around 9.30 at night, realizing that it was very quiet. You know, going back to the earliest days, um, when Judah Hernandez and I were sitting at a soccer game, I had just finished my master's in cinema and media studies. And I was talking to Judah and I said, I, you know, I've always wanted to start a film festival and I went back to do my master's so I could do that. And he just looked at me and said, oh my God, you know, I want to do that too. She couldn't believe her ears because she was just thinking the same thing. Two very different people from two very different worlds connected like magnets. We just did it. It's part of that entrepreneurial spirit um, to doing something like this, but it also goes back to just a love of, of film. Film for me is a way to take an idea and turn it into something tangible. It's the way that we connect with other human beings. For a not-for-profit, um, you have to be invested in what you're doing. And I think this festival is, is so much about the community it's so much about the people that are on the board. It's so much about the volunteers. And we couldn't do the festival without all that sweat equity. <laughs> Let me tell you, those early days were fun, but chaos. <laughs> it was just trying to figure out how this could work. But in order to do that, you need, you need money, you need support, you need funding. There's two sponsors that come to mind. The first one is Christopher and Vidiata, who back in the earliest years of the festival, very first year, came on board as our only sponsor and believed in the event and the potential you know, of the festival and the community. The second sponsor who's so integral to the, the festival is Peter Wilson. Peter Wilson came Mention, on board I did, uh, uh, I as a title sponsor. There's 101 it, movies for you to see and you should come on out and check out the rest of the festival and I neglected to tell you where. So if you could go, all of our films for tomorrow and Sunday are going to be shown at film.ca, which is in Oakville on Spears Road. They are a huge supporter of the Oakville Film Festival and I strongly encourage you to go out and see the rest of the films. Come on up, guys, come on. <laughs> Well, I think that um, both films were amazing. I, I love, what I'm really loving about the film festival this year is that the theme for me is acceptance and love in any way, shape or form that it, it presents to you. And both of these films showed that very, very well, I think. What I also liked about these two films is that they were very music centric. And I would like, first of all, before I get into the questions, if everyone could just introduce yourselves and let me know who you were in the films. Hannah Gatan, producer. For Polarized. For Polarized, sorry. Uh, Shamim Sarif, writer-director of Polarized. Uh, Maxine Dennis, I play Dahlia Dejani in Polarized. Uh, I'm Holly DeVoe, and I played Lisa in Polarized. Um, I'm Ingrid Venninger. I wrote, directed, and produced the short film, If You Were Me. So I did want both of the directors to just talk to me a little bit about the impact of music and the use of music in the films. And was music a big part of the film from conception, or was it something that grew into the film? Um, okay, for me... Uh, Yes, yeah, so I had made a, a, a short film with my daughter, so it was only fair that I make a short film with my son. 
Um, he, he was in the film and he's a musician and that's a good friend of his. Hannah's also a musician. So um, I very much love to write scripts for people that I know it's actually the first time she's ever acted in anything. And uh, music is a huge, huge part of their life. And typically I make long form, but I'm, I'm teaching at York University right now and I'm teaching nor uh, short narrative fiction. So I thought I got to walk the talk and make a short, yeah. Okay, but, and so the music came from the fact that your son is, is a musician. Okay, that's very cool. Uh, well, for me, when I'm, I, I always have playlists going when I'm writing something, just for the rhythm, for feelings of mood and character. Um, but in Polarized, I think, um, because uh, the lead, one of the leads is a, is a singer-songwriter, it was a very important, even more important part of the story for me, because for me, uh, Lisa's journey was not just about somebody coming to terms with sexuality, but also somebody who felt so constrained as an artist, um, or their potential as an artist, that they had to get out of that town or, or die, you know, internally. So, so it was a very important part of the story. Um, and then it became, uh, with the soundtrack, it really became a big way to explore, the, another way to explore the differences between the two sides of this town. Um, through the different music. Um, and it was really a privilege to be able to journey through Palestinian music, modern Palestinian music, and see what, what incredible stuff is coming out of the West Bank and Gaza. And also, um, and also to indulge my, uh, my love for country music, which people don't usually think is going to be a thing, but it is. <laughs> so there. And who doesn't love good country music? Um, what I also liked, though, you said she was struggling to get out of a small town to express her creative self. It was also to express her true self, right, which she couldn't express in a small town because she was constricted creatively and with love. And I, I liked that parallel. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll let Holly speak a bit more to this, but we, we talked about it a lot that, um, that uh, sometimes the potential is not obvious when you just have things presented to you in a certain way. Um, and certainly I think that's been true of, uh, of Hanan and my experience growing up and um, in some ways. Um, and so, you know, that was something that, that we discussed uh, when we talked about Lisa. Yeah, we definitely did. <laughs> um, and I think we definitely talked about the idea that this character really had her feet on the ground, you know, like she wasn't necessarily escaping into the internet, like maybe you might see with a lot of young people these days. She lived very, um, very much in the present moment. And she just couldn't do that without pain in this little town. Which is a common theme for even big cities, right? Like it, it, the constriction of love, true love, self-expression, it's, it's a very important thing. And, and this in Pride Month, I think that it's a very important film to be showing tonight. Um, and for people to just internalize, what I loved about the film, it wasn't, and don't take this the wrong way, preachy, right? You were very fair in showing both sides of one coin. And I think that that was a, a very good way for you to um, educate people. And Great. I like that. Well, thank you. I mean, it's difficult, but I tried to kind of, um, I guess, uh, channel what, you know, I guess you understand, you know, people, you, you may not approve, you may not uh, be able to condone um, exclusivity when people are trying to exclude other people, but you have to understand where it comes from because otherwise there's kind of no hope to get past it. So you can't just pretend it doesn't matter or just paint it as black and white. So for Lisa's mom, you know, she really thought she was doing the best thing you know, for her, for her kid to kind of get rid of the, these, these feelings that are just going to make a big, uh, uh, you know, create a big problem for her, for her and in her mind for her daughter. So I guess it's trying to kind of understand the character and not be judgmental of a character, um, even though it may be tempting. It always is. And so for your film, what I really liked about the first part of it was that you, you didn't have any dialogue really with the actors. They were sitting there in silence, taking each other in. Um, how did you come to that, to that moment? Because I, I always find that the silence in films speak way more volumes than sometimes what you say. 
Yeah, a lot of that also was trying to compress into 11 minutes um, a lot of different things. So playing with sound, out of sync with image, playing with music, out of sync with action, um, to try to compress and concentrate the story. I also love the interview format, but oftentimes when I'm interviewed, I wanna ask questions back. Like I don't, the, the dialogue. Um, so I like this idea of, and did any, has anyone heard of the 36 questions? It was published in the New York Times. If you ask someone 36 questions and you look in their eyes, you're gonna fall in love with them by the end of, yeah, the three sets, right? So I was inspired by that and I tested it out. I didn't actually fall in love with who I was asking. But um, they took some of the questions from the internet and they made up some of their own, but everything was scripted. So the questions were scripted, the answers were scripted, and that idea of just gazing into someone's eyes, it's not something we do very often, and I'm in love with awkward moments. So I thought I'd start with that. Well, and there were a few awkward moments there, right? Um, especially with the whole, I, I love how you just kind of slid that baby discussion in there. And by the way, um, so, with, with Polarized, was this a movie, a film, a script that you had been working on for a long time? Was it, was it a, it's obvious that it was a passion project. It came across really well. How long did it take from inception to completion for this film? <laughs> Many years, uh, over five years. We had COVID, obviously that's COVID. the things. But yeah, I think it's been about five years ago we started writing it. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, around Trump and Brexit, Shumi was not very happy, so she she went to her writing cabin in, in the garden and started writing. Uh, but you know, it takes a long time to raise funding for independent feature films, and uh, so that took the journey. Then we stopped with COVID and started again. So yeah, I think around five years. And the backdrop of farming and agriculture, growth, all of that stuff, that was, that was pretty key and it, it touched on, again, the growth of, of the two lead characters, the, the growth of, of their love and I, I liked that backdrop. Were you always planning to film it in Manitoba? Yeah, from pretty early on we did a scout there and then we also looked at Northern Ontario and, and lots of different places but there was just something about those those prairies, those skies, that ice, sense of isolation that was just really incredible, plus that feeling of old and new with the farming. And I think that um, there was just such a stark contrast there, you know, with big cornfields. It was very important to me to have very, very big cornfields. And, uh, and country music. And country music. But, um, but yeah, so, so that was kind of high on our agenda to shoot there. And... Um, and the farming, I think, was kind of, uh, it was a really interesting, it was something I've been interested in, especially the science of it. And, and I think, you know, we're living in a world where we're all worrying about being extinct from, you know, by AI in, a, in, in the future and things like that. So there's this strong tension between technology and, and tradition and, um, and the way things are moving too fast for people. So this was kind of a way to have a microcosm of that and to understand how traditional farmers might feel when faced with this kind of, um, you know, new, new age technology, even though it might be what we need. Very good. Um, I did want to, before I continue asking all my questions, see if there's any questions from the audience uh, for any, anybody up here. I well, then please ask it. Film, long or short, so thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is for Shamim because the the two women, I think it's kind of beautiful what you've done, where they come from such different backgrounds, but quite oppressive in their families. And I wonder um, when you were writing this, what the necessity was for both of these women to have to lose their families in order to be with one another, um, and how you came to that. So. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, kind stranger. Uh, <laughs> um, one of my one of my actors from sort of the 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 um, the uh, series that I'm very obviously very exhausted from directing. Sorry, and there's lots of lots of sort of people here. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, what was the necessity? I really didn't want it to be a necessity, but then you know therein lies the drama. But <laughs> 
But I think uh, it was more that I didn't want it to be kind of a blame game for the families or a coming out story, but I felt like, I think, uh, I think when Hanan and I came out, and it was a long time ago now, it's 27 years we've been together. Um, thank you. Thank you. Very, very big achievement for Hanan to deal with me for that long, for sure. Um, but, you know, at that, it, I guess that what happens is that you have to grow up really, really fast. And even if you're in your early 20s, I think it can be something that um, a lot of people never experience or experience it very late in life because you have to challenge everything that you've been brought up with, everything that's making your family um, deal and, 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 you know, their values. So I think that was the kind of journey that I wanted Dahlia and Lisa to go on. It, it felt very real to me that they have to begin to see the world through their own eyes. And sometimes that means like pulling away from the family. I, I like to think that there's hope for Dahlia and Lisa with their families. I don't know, what do you think family-wise? <laughs> Polarized too, anybody? <laughs> um, no, I actually, I think that's exactly what it was. You left it sort of open-ended for that exact reason. You know, we saw both sides of the family struggle with what they did. It wasn't like, you know, Lisa's mom was like, oh, you know, we put her on the ground, she's, she's out of our lives forever, we're done with her. And it wasn't like, you know, my family, my father and Dahlia's family, they didn't just like, you know, throw her out. We saw in Eli, who's in the crowd right now, his response to pushing Dahlia out of the house. You saw pain, you saw struggles with that. So I think that there was that dichotomy there, that, that aspect of even them, they had to take the time to come to terms with what was told to them because it is shocking right Dahlia coming to her family being like I want a divorce I can't do this anymore and you know with a really Christian family Lisa coming and being honest about that and I think there there's a all those struggles combined really need to be portrayed and like you both said it's something you have been through and wanted to show you know on on screen and so yeah I definitely think that there there's hope to that I think at the end of the day Dahlia and Lisa figure each other out and then eventually we'll reconnect in the future. You know, I, I think that's something that's pretty beautiful about that. I would like to hold both microphones. Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure about Lisa and her mom. I think that one's gonna take a little bit of work, but I think the brother is a little more, yeah, Tara, you did such a beautiful job there. And you could really see your internal, the character's internal struggle too, because it's tough to, to you know, basically cut off a daughter like that. Um, and I think maybe way down the line they might work it out, but there was definitely some love found back again with the brother, I think. And there was definitely hope, I think, for your family. I, I, think, I think in the end you have to decide to have life on your own terms and yeah. then offer it back to the family. And That's sometimes really nice. that works and sometimes, you know, it doesn't. But. Lisa's mom needed some time, I yeah, think. Yeah, that might be a long time. Yeah. yeah. Were there any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have a um, speaking of family, uh, one of the, uh, one of the my, my favorite parts of your, your earlier movies, Shamim, is uh, the little cameo appearances of family members. Um, and uh, tell me a little bit about your, your son. Your son is in this movie. Uh, was that something that uh, he wanted to do? Um, and also for uh, in the other movie, I mean, really, it's it's a family affair, is it not? I mean, yes. are your are your kids involved uh, on their own volition? And um... well, no, this is how we keep it low budget. We just <laughs> it's really got nothing nothing to do with them. We just tell them where to be, <laughs> send them a call sheet, and they show up, which is good, I suppose. But uh, I'll let Hanan talk about this. But actually, both both our sons were in this movie. You might not recognize one because they're he's he's just hairy and huge, <laughs> and obviously it looks as if I I couldn't possibly have a child of that age. But there you go. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, uh, Ethan and Luke are in all of our films. They have little cameos. They're tech engineers, coders. They don't want anything to do with the industry. They're very used to being on set, etc. But they're just very blasé about it. And I think they just you know, show up and do their thing and... It's more for the parents, right? Yeah, well, it's good because they can earn a living and be actors. It's fantastic. <laughs> and Sorry. your son, did oh, he enjoy being in the film or was this something you had to kind of encourage? No, I mean, as a mother, I think a recurring theme in my work is how to 
balance being a parent and an artist. You know, the work takes me away from home a lot. So oftentimes it's what does it contribute back to the family? I have my partner of 30 years in the house, um, John Switzer, and he's the sound recordist on this film. And the, the kids have been part of my features from the beginning, starting from the age of eight and 12 and 14 and 17 and 21. And, and they're in the next one. It's a whole family affair this summer that we're shooting. I think it was um, a, a question of sustainability and keeping the family together, honestly. If my work consistently took me away, I don't know how it would work. It would fall apart. But in terms of consent, um, yeah, they give their consent. And I'm kind of happy to say my granddaughter, who just turned four, has given her consent to be in my next film, and she wants to be called Freya. So she's even given me her character name, yeah. So I did want to ask one more question from each of you, and I have asked some of you this when we did the interviews before. What is the main, you, you can watch the movie and you see what it's telling, but what is the main thing that when butts leave seats here today that you want people to take away in their heart from the movie? The main theme, the main thing that they talk about or that they carry with them when they leave the theater. And we'll start on this end. Go get people to buy tickets and see now. Spoken like a true producer. Uh, no, I mean, for me, it's, it's really important to support um, independent films and films that are made with passion and love and that are very relevant to today. And uh, for me, it's about um, showing I'm Palestinian, Canadian, and it's important to show the other, and there are many other communities that don't really um, get the chance to be explored and seen on, on the screen. So, so, so it's just getting people to be exposed to the themes of the, the film and its diversity at many levels. Uh, gosh, that's a tough one, but um, I think uh, two things. One is that uh, freedom of speech, which is a big topic right now, does not include exclusion. Uh, and that for me, that's where the line is drawn. You can say anything you want to, but when you're excluding people, that becomes crosses out of freedom of speech and something else entirely. Um, and the second thing is that those amazing songs that Brooke Paulson sang are now on Spotify, so look her up. Um, agreed to the buying the tickets thing. Um, but also I think as... You know, when you're an actor, I think it's not something you go into lightly because it is a tough gig. It's a tough job. And so I guess my message uh, for everybody here to take away from this film would be that if there's something, you know, gnawing at your heart, something you want, something you would be so sort of in awe to achieve, uh, whether it's love or, you know, opening a farm or going out and doing music or being an actor, go for it, you know, push for that, push for that and uh, get what you want, basically, because um, you deserve it. I think that's my message. Uh, gotta stop. I got to stop doing that. <laughs> I'll be leaving here with a microphone, I think. <laughs> um, I guess I would say if there's something you're gonna leave with, it's the idea of staying curious because I think we fear what we do not know. And throughout this film, both films, as you, as you get to know the person opposite you, I mean, hey, yours was an interview, I guess, right? And our characters were so far apart until we got to know each other. Same with the families, they seemed like they were on completely different sides. So you're, we're afraid of what we don't know, so stay curious. Um, well, I'm very passionate about reproductive rights, so our bodies are a choice. And, um, yeah, I'll just end with that. Okay, I lied. I have one last question for the two directors. What is next on your docket? Um, next on my docket? I am... A, Remember Dogma 95, the manifesto coming out of uh, Denmark? 
Well, it's going to be 30 years old in 2025. So I'm currently making a dogma film with my entire family um, playing sort of fictional versions of themselves in real circumstances. It's called This Is Not An Exercise. And um, I'm writing two feature films. And I want to give a shout out to the Dean of AMPD who's in the house tonight who came all the way out here. Sarah Bae Jung is in the house. So if anybody is interested in coming to York and following their dreams, um, we've got the Dean in the house. And so think about York. So, uh, you know, I know Team Shamim saw me lean in to ask Hanan what was next in my docket because I've got a really big spreadsheet and it's color coded with the different projects. But I'm told that uh, next is, uh, is Arranged, which is our, uh, the next feature film that we'll be doing, which is a romantic comedy uh, with two queer South Asian young women pushed into an arranged marriage by their parents. Oh. So some light fare there. There you go. Thank you all very much for spending some time with me and for these beautiful films. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you very much.